Organization, Society, and Education. Our program today is co-sponsored by Oregon Campus Compact and Learn and Serve America. And there's information on both organizations at the back of the table, and we appreciate the opportunity to co-sponsor this program with them. Just a reminder to please turn off your cell phones and pagers, if you would. And I have just a few announcements, as always. Next Friday's forum features Governor Ted Kulangoski. It'll be upstairs in the fourth floor ballroom. And um, we, luncheon reservations are now open to both members and non-members, but must be made, paid in advance so we can keep the check-in line as swift as possible. You can register online at www.pdxcityclub.org or call the club office by Wednesday afternoon. Uh, just a reminder, by now you should have received a special appeal from President-elect Susan Hammer asking you to support the City Club's annual fund. The, the annual fund is an essential part of the club's operating budget, so I'd, I encourage you all to make your contributions um, as you can, as quickly as possible. There's a, there's a return envelope in today's program, and there's also envelopes back at the table. Other upcoming events include our Citizens Read Book Group, which meets uh, this coming Monday, October 24th to discuss Freakonomics. And that will be uh, at the City Club Commons uh, at 9th and Washington. Next Friday is October's final Friday, and it's uh, our regular monthly open house from 4.30 to 6 at the City Club Commons. It's a great informal opportunity to meet other club members, staff, and club leaders. Details on all these, line, uh, on all these items can be found in your weekly bulletin or online at our website. Our sponsors this quarter, who make the broadcast of the City Club Forum possible, are McEwen Gisbold LLP and Medico Support Services of the Northwest Incorporated. Would you please join me in thanking our sponsors? <laughs> to today's program, Benjamin Barber is the Gershon and Carol Kext Professor of Civil Society and distinguished university professor at the University of Maryland and a principal of the Democracy, Democracy Collaborative. He splits his time between College Park, Maryland, and Manhattan. Dr. Barber thinks about the evolving challenges of democracy and citizenship on the world stage. His 1995 book, Jihad versus McWorld, examined how global capitalism sells popular American products, TV, movies, fast food, and other parts of the world where traditional cultures struggle to maintain their values and religion. After the attacks of September 11th, 2001, his book was brought back into print because of its argument that exporting capitalism without democracy risks anarchy and terrorism. He served as an advisor on global culture to President Bill Clinton, an unhappy experience he has described in his book, The Truth of Power. He claims to have never aspired to be an academic. He's always had a passion for the arts and has found the time to be involved in writing and directing plays off-Broadway and productions for television but, he told the Washington Post a few years ago, the pay is lousy. So he became a public intellectual, where presumably the pay is better, <laughs> and is here with us today at City Club. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Barber. Thanks, Doug Marker, Chris Smith, Campus Compact and the City Club for hosting this luncheon today about a, an issue that I know vexes all Americans, vexes folks here, vexes folks on the East Coast, the role of education in the United States, both secondary and higher education, particularly with respect to the crisis of democracy, the crisis of citizenship that we face. And I think uh, most Americans feel ambivalent about the role of schooling. On the one hand, they know that schools are supposed to play a crucial role in the education of citizens. On the other hand, they're discouraged by the problems of public education, discouraged by the taxes that public ed education costs, and thinking maybe that schools like government, to quote Ronald Reagan, are part of the problem and not part of the solution. So there are a lot of issues here for us to deal with, and I want to try just briefly uh, this afternoon to raise certain questions that I think as we address these issues we need uh, to be thinking about. I want to say a word about young people. There is a serious civic gap uh, in generationally between the young and the rest of us. In elections, young people participate between uh, 18 and 25 participated about 
15%. We all participated around 50% in presidential elections. In local elections, we, it goes down for us to 30 or 20%. With young people, it can go down to 5%. Young people participate a lot less, even in the minimal signs of citizenship like voting, let alone other things. We also know that there's a lot of alienation, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, and a lot of cynicism and skepticism among the young about our political institutions, about politics, and about citizenship. Some comes out in pathological behavior, the behavior of goth school shootings. We know just recently it, it's, it always is disturbing when you see a 15-year-old involved in a violent murder, as we just learned last night was the case in the recent murder. Uh, in uh, down south here uh, of a well-known lawyer's wife. You know, that turns out to be a young man, 15 years old, who was engaged in a very, very violent act. Where was that? How could a 15-year-old feel so violent? Where was that coming from? And we see that again and again. So we know there's a big problem uh, with the younger generation. We know also there's a problem with uh, public education and the funding of public education. Just as recently as 1991, uh, on average, about 75% of the funding for public universities and colleges came from states and from tax revenues. Today, that average is down to about 62%, about 12 points down. And there are states, Virginia, it's 8%. In Wisconsin, it's about 18%. All the rest have to be raised in other ways. I'm going to talk in a minute about some of the problems of higher ed, for example, the commercialization of higher education, the coca colization of higher ed, the selling out with Coca-Cola contracts, but a lot of that's desperation by institutions that are no longer being publicly supported and looking where they can to uh, acquire the funding that they think they need. So there's a problem with young people, there's a problem with the funding of uh, higher and uh, secondary education, and even K to 12, we have increasingly uh, issues and standards being set by federal and state authorities that don't want to pay for them. We call them unfunded mandates, uh, but no child left behind may be one example of that because a whole lot of things are required of schools for which little funding uh, is made available. We also want to remember that our public schools, as we watch them not function as well as we'd like them to, our public schools have become the last resort social institutions in a lot of inner cities, which is to say they don't just do schooling, they do uh, pregnancy information, they act uh, as drug counseling services, uh, they're where we deal with gangs and gang-related violence. They have, in other words, become the last standing public institutions in the inner city, and they do a whole lot more than just educate kids in the classroom. And they're stretched thin, and they don't do any of it very well as a consequence. So the situation we start with is a kind of desperate one. Someone looking down from Mars would say, never has America needed its public schools and its state and public colleges and universities more than it does today. It needs it to stay competitive in a globalized world. It needs it to create citizens and overcome the deracination and alienation of young people from the society. It needs it to educate a workforce that will be competitive with the increasingly educated global workforce elsewhere. Yet at this very moment when we more need our public institutions than ever, we are suspicious of them, we are defunding them, we are looking for alternatives to them. And all of that suggests a set of dilemmas that clearly need to be addressed. So let me start by just reminding us very, very briefly of a simple historical fact. Public education in the United States from the time of the founding on was conceived as an essential foundation for the working of our democracy. The founders were very clear about this. They said, we can give you a good constitution, we can write a bill of rights, but those are simply pieces of paper without active, responsible, competent, engaged citizens capable of discharging their responsibilities and making that constitution work. Democracies depend on citizens, not the other way around. Without an active, engaged citizenry, 
democracies simply don't work. That's, by the way, if you want to know why things aren't going so well, even in Kabul or in Baghdad or in, even in Moscow with democracy, it's because they've got the paraphernalia and infrastructure of democracy without a engaged, active citizen body. And democratic institutions without citizens just don't work. The founders knew that. Thomas Jefferson said the most important thing he did, you can go look on his tombstone at Monticello. It's written there. He said, I only did three important things in my life. He doesn't mention the Louisiana Purchase. He doesn't mention that he was Secretary of State and Vice President. He doesn't mention his two-term presidency. He says, I authored the Declaration of Independence and was a partial author of the Virginia Declaration of Religious Freedom, which was in effect their equivalent of the Bill of Rights, and I was the father of the University of Virginia. He was prouder of that than he was that he was president of the United States for two terms and founder of the Democratic Party. And that was because for Jefferson there was an invisible logic between the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and education. He said clearly, if we did not educate every citizen well in the responsibilities of citizens, you give, give them the information and background to discharge those responsibilities, democracy would fail. And this wasn't just a party thing. Up in Massachusetts, John Adams, from the Federalist side, was making the same argument in, in the 1780s and insisting that Massachusetts, back then, before the Constitution was ratified, introduce schooling for all young men who would be citizens. And of course we know since then, after emancipation, the emancipation of the slaves, after the introduction of the franchise for women, the first thing we did is say, unless there is schooling for African Americans who were slaves, they cannot be effective citizens. Unless women are educated equally to men, the enfranchisement of women will not work. We've understood at every step of the way that education and citizenship our cousins, twins, they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. But in recent years, for a lot of different reasons we haven't got room to talk about, time to talk about today, we have kind of lost touch with that tradition. We think of our schools professionally and vocationally. We think about them as job training. We think about them in terms of the three R's, and God knows that's important, just giving people fundamental education. But you don't hear very much anymore about the civic mission of our schools, even though historically that defined public education, both K-12 and higher education in the United States, even though for two centuries we believed that our schools were the nurseries of democracy, the nurseries of citizenship, without which our democracy ultimately would fail. Now, some of that had to do, the changes had to do with the coming of the Johns Hopkins, the German research model of the university, when universities in the late 19th century became more engaged in research, in medicine, in professional training. Some of it had to do with the vocationalization of the university in the 20th century. And more recently, we've seen the effect of the corporatization and commercialization of the university and universities as kind of trade colleges, training grounds simply for employers and so on. An important task, but no longer related to that core civic mission that colleges, schools, and universities have had. Another part of the problem has come from the fact that the universities themselves, colleges, high schools, and their faculties have themselves apparently lost touch with the civic mission of the university. At Rutgers University, for 10 years, I worked hard to create a community service learning program that would be an integral part of the program. And most of my colleagues on the faculty said, that's very nice, but what does that have to do with higher education? What are you doing that for? Some of them even said to me, some of my friends in philosophy and history said, what are you talking about? I'm a liberal arts teacher. What's liberal arts have to do with citizenship? And I had to remind them of the history of that term, the etymology of the liberal arts. Because in fact, the liberal arts are quite literally the arts of liberty. And in the Middle Ages, the early medieval university, which was teaching the only people in the Middle Ages who were free, they were teaching them the arts of liberty, how to exercise the rights and liberties of a freeman in a feudal society where most people weren't free. 
Now, that's what the arts of liberty are. The liberal arts were teaching people how to be free. And of course, that was a recognition that though we are technically born free, or rhetorically born free, we're actually born into dependency. And we acquire freedom only through learning, education, and experience. We have to grow into the freedom which we make a claim for with our human birthright, but which we don't actually enjoy. Freedom has to be learned. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who visited America in the 1830s and wrote that remarkable book called Democracy in America, talked about what he called the apprenticeship of liberty. The most arduous of all apprenticeships, he said. Wonderful phrase, the apprenticeship of liberty. Liberty has to be learned, and it's learned slowly over time. We are born seven-pound weaklings and remain dependent and unfree for a very long time. 10, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Some of the kids are still at home at 40. We know it takes a long time for young people to really gain their feet, acquire their independence, their autonomy, and their liberty. And they have to, in part, learn that through experience, through schooling. The founders understood this. The land-grant college people understood this. State and public universities understood this. The campus compact people understand this today. But a lot of America, including the people who work inside colleges and universities and high schools, seem to have forgotten it. And an awful lot of citizens have forgotten it too. That that crucial civic role of education in the apprenticeship of liberty that allows us to be come to understand what it means to be responsible citizens in a democracy, empowered citizens in a democracy. We somehow think that that lesson just gets taught all by itself. My field, social science, is partly responsible. A lot of us in social science give the impression that to be a citizen is nothing more than to be a voter, and to be a voter is to do nothing more than to express your private opinion. Voting and polling are thought to be the same thing. Asking someone, what do you want? What's your preference? What's your prejudice? That's what it means to be a citizen. But that's not what it is to be a citizen. Citizenship is about deliberative, consensual thinking about seeking common ground and adjudicating differences, not simply saying, here's what I want. Americans know how to say, here's what I want very, very well. Everybody learns that. Americans are no longer very good at saying, Here's what we as a community need. That's what public thinking does. That's what deliberative thinking does. That's what civic thinking does. It makes us think not just about ourselves, but about the communities we learn we belong to, communities of the family, communities of our church, communities of the workplace. What do those communities need, and what do I as a member of that community want to see happen for my community? That's the civic question. That question hardly gets raised. The media don't talk about it. The polling organizations don't talk about it. A lot of the time, the politicians don't talk about it. They simply just say, what do you want? Vote for me. I'll give you what you want more than my opponent will. And that's how we talk about politics. And that's how we've been educated, to the extent we have, to think about politics. And that's deadly to democracy. No wonders we live in a divided, polarized nation where people don't even understand the meaning of civility. And by the way, civility doesn't mean being polite to one another. Civility means engaging our vital and important differences with respect and tolerance for one another. It doesn't mean not having differences. Of course, we will have many deep differences, even differences over moral and religious values. But how we deal with these differences, do we say to the person who has a different view than we do, you're un-American? Or do we say, I can't agree with that, let me argue with you, let me explain to you why I think you're wrong. Do we say to someone, if you don't support the Patriot Act, you're a traitor? Or do we say, there's an issue here about the relationship between liberty and security in difficult times when terrorists are threatening America. Let's see if we can find a boundary we can agree on because obviously, for me, you've taken the boundary a little too far. I want to pull it back. That's what civility does. Civility is a part of what you learn when you learn the arts of liberty. And our inability even to talk to one another as fellow Americans about the issues that divide us but instead to be polarized and mutually dismissive 
and one side are traitors and the other side are called fascists. You know, that kind of language, not only does it not help us find common ground, but it actually makes it impossible for us to exercise a common citizenry. And that's, again, what civic education is supposed to do. And civic education can only happen if the institutions of our society are willing to be engaged in it. Now, part of this is about what it means for us to belong to a public. And that term public has come under assault in recent decades in ways that I think is dangerous to the future of democracy. Now, we are a republic, but you know the etymology of that term, res publica, the Latin for the things of the public, the things we share together. That's what a republic is. It's about the things we share together. That means the ideal of the public. We sometimes talk about the commonwealth, the common wheel, the public good. Those terms have sort of come under assault. It's all about privatization. What do you want? What do I want? What's my group want? What's your group want? Not about the we, about the us, about the public, about the common wheel. And again, citizen training and citizen education is about discovering and figuring out what it is that we share in common and how when we don't share things in common, we nonetheless can find ways to live together without shooting each other. Because remember, democracy is not a system for people who agree with one another. People who agree with one another don't need democracy. They can just all nod at one another and smile and say, aren't we smart? We figured it all out. We all agree with one another. Democracy is precisely a system for people who don't agree. And the deeper they disagree, even on fundamentals, the more they need democracy because the alternative to democracy is reading each other out of the commonweal, calling each other traitors, and that, of course, in time leads to, in effect, civil war of one kind or another. You know, we start out calling each other's names and we end up shooting one another, and if you want to see the results of that, look at what's going on in Mosul and in Baghdad and other parts of the world where tribal differences run so deep and democracy is so shallow that in the end people would rather kill each other than try to find ways to adjudicate the differences. But it doesn't just happen. It's hard work. We live under the illusion, having experienced democracy for a couple hundred years, I think, of believing that it's just something that goes along. It's like an old jacket. You know, you have a cold winter, oh, let's get my old jacket out of the closet need it now. Democracy is, we treat like the old jacket. Oh, we've got some tough times here. We've got some tough disagreements. Let's get, let's get democracy out of the closet and put it on. But democracy is like a muscle. You have to use it for it to work. You have to exercise it. You have to know how to leverage it for it to work. It's an ongoing process, and it has to be worked at all of the time. Last night in Vancouver, I was with a group there whose title is Making Democracy Work. It's a great title because we have to make democracy work. It's not an automaton. It doesn't go by itself. It's not something you possess. It's not like a car you take out of the garage once in a while. It's something that we use. It's a process. And if we don't know how to use it and we don't exercise it, we lose it. It's like a good relationship. You, know, you can never stop working at a relationship. And those of you who've been married for a long time know that. Sometimes you think, well, 10 years, 20 years, now 30 years, now I've been married long, and now I can just relax. Yeah. Then comes the divorce the next day. You work all your life on a relationship. You can never stop working. That's what a relationship is. It's an active engagement that requires permanent attention. Democracy is just like that. It requires ongoing, permanent attention, permanent work, you can do good. You can think we got great solidarity and social capital here. Portland's done some great things. Oregon's done some great things. Back in the 90s, Oregon had, I thought, an admirable health solution to health problems and so on. Ten years later, where is it? You know, things change. You have to keep working at it. You can't sit back on your laurels. Democracy is work. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes learning. Oscar Wilde said, the end of the 19th century, he said, the trouble with socialism is it takes up too many free evenings. <laughs> Democracy takes up an awful lot of afternoons and mornings as well. It's a lot of work. That's one reason young people aren't involved. They'll say, oh, I haven't got time. I'm busy. 
I'm playing my video game. I'm going to the mall. There's a football game. I got homework to do. I got to make a visit home again. I got a part-time job that keeps me in school. Haven't got time for it. And again, with democracy, we have to learn that if we don't work at it and pay attention to it, we lose it. I like to remind young people that democracy ultimately is not just about responsibility and rights and liberty. It is about power. Democracy is the system that says this. There is power in the world that is used all the time by those who have it. And democracy says the only just and effective and safe way to live with a world of power is to share it and to regulate it and to oversee it and make sure we all have some access to it and voice in decisions that use it. It's about power. But that's important because it means if we decide we're not interested and we don't want a piece of power, somebody else is right there who will do it. If kids in the university said, we're too busy, you know, we're not really concerned, someone else said, don't, don't you worry about it. You know, we'll, we'll take care of it. And that's the beginning of tyranny. That's the beginning of the loss of power. So I believe that there is a fundamental role to be played by our schools, our colleges and universities, and particularly by our public education system, whether it's high school or college or K through 12, in helping to create an understanding of citizenship and to in help impart the skills and arts of liberty that people need to exercise that citizenship. And when we give up on public education, we give up on the forging of an American public. Because public education isn't just public and how it's funded and who's allowed to go to schools. Public education is public because it helps create the American public. It helps bring together our diversified populations. In Los Angeles, there are 162 languages spoken now by the families in the school system. How can those folks become Americans and American citizens unless they have some sense of what it means to belong to a public, to be part of a public, and our public universities and our public schools do that? I got my PhD at Harvard, I've taught at Princeton, I've taught at Cambridge University, but I cherish the fact that I've spent my life at Rutgers University, the State University of New Jersey, and now, towards the end of my career, at the University of Maryland. Great public universities. And I can tell you there's a fundamental difference, fine as Harvard is and Princeton is, between what happens in great private research universities and what happens in our public universities that are devoted to educating every young person who's able to gain entry to it because the young people who are in our public universities believe deeply in the possibilities of what it means to be an American citizen, to belong to the public. And that's the one space I know where young people still have a clear shot at getting some grasp at the meaning of citizenship, particularly as with groups like Campus Compact and Campus Learning Organizations, more emphasis is again put on preparation for civic life. Because in the rest of the time, those young people are getting messages from our society that are very different. You know, the real educators of our young people today are not teachers, not pastors, and not parents. Most people spend most of their time, most young people spend most of their time in front of the pixels. The pixelated little computer screens, the TV screens, and the big screens at the malls. And the messages they get from those, whatever else it is, we can argue about what it is or should be, is not a civic message. It's not about citizenship. It may be about money, it may be about violence, it may be about pornography, it may be about sex and celebrity and glamour and sports and a lot of other things. It certainly is not a message that any of us would design if we said, what do we want young people to learn about citizenship? Well, I know what, just go on the internet, you'll find that like that. Or just go to the mall, go to the triplex. I'm sure any one of the movies you see will help you be learn what it means to be a citizen. We know that the real tutors in the world today are the commercial culture. And we know the message that is coming from commercial culture is not a message that has very much to do with citizenship, whatever else it is. I won't characterize it other word. Otherwise, some of us feel it's nothing but violence, commerce, and pornography. Others think it's just entertainment and so on, and that's OK. But either way, it's not about citizenship. So who's going to do it? Most kids aren't in church or mosque or synagogue anymore. 
They're not home long enough, even for the good parents who are there to really have an impact, let alone the grandparents and so on, who are probably living in some other city somewhere else. And the teachers only have them, I have my students in a course three hours a week. If they're in high school, we might have them 30 hours a week for what, 30 weeks a year out of 52. But those pixels are there in front of their eyeballs six to eight hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. It's a permanent, ubiquitous culture out there that's teaching its own lessons. I leave it to you to decide what kind of lessons they are, but I think the one thing we can all agree on is that it's not the lessons, particularly that we are anxious to teach people about liberty, about citizenship, about responsibility, about civility, or much of anything else that we care about. And however much we disagree about the specific issues, whether it's abortion or embryonic cell research or the war in Iraq, that's, those issues aren't even there. That's not what it's about. Something quite different is coming to our young people, which means I think the only institutional resource we have to try to get kids back on track to begin to think again about citizenship is our schools, our universities, our public colleges. But if we're going to do that, we can argue about exactly how, and there are lots of good and meaningful arguments about what an ideal program looks like. Do you make civic, uh, civics an add-on, or do you make it part of the whole social studies program? Do you make community service something kids do on Saturday afternoon, or do you introduce it, as I'd like to, into the learning program, the critical program of the university? Those are all good questions. But for any of those questions even to be raised, we've got to fund and support our schools so that they are able then to do what it is in the end we decide is important for them to do. I mean, the funding question is absolutely crucial. If we have decided that our public institutions are part of the problem and not part of the solution, and we are turning our backs on the common wheel, on our common goods, on our public goods and our public institutions, then we are in effect, I believe, disempowering ourselves. We are yielding our democratic decision-making power to try to make common decisions about what a good education, what good citizenship looks like. And the problem I have, therefore, with defunding and so on is that it basically makes any discussion later on of how to do it impossible because, in effect, you've removed the instrumentalities by which we can do it. So a people who care, I think, have to do things in two stages. They have to say, First of all, we will support our public institutions, our public libraries, our public museums, our public schools, our public colleges, our public universities. But second of all, we have a right to argue and talk about how they operate and what they're doing and whether the professoriate gets what it ought to be doing and whether the syllabus meets the needs of a civic curriculum. But don't ask for the second right, even as one is refusing to pay the freight on the first. And of course, that's what we tend to be doing. We're saying, first of all, we're defunding you, and second of all, we don't like the, what you're doing and how you're doing it. We think you ought to do it differently. But we have to give as citizens our support to public institutions and then ourselves act like citizens and make the arguments about what we think needs to be done and how it needs to be done and what standards people have to be upheld to. The government has a right to mandate outcomes in schools. I'm not against that. I believe in the autonomy and independence of schooling, but I also believe that a government has a right to say there are minimal things that have to be done, including civics. But it doesn't have a right to say that at the same moment it's stripping away the funding. It doesn't have a right to say, do more civic education, but go to the Coca-Cola company and the Pepsi-Cola company and get 10 and $20 million grants and let them put their banners up and their machines up and so on and let them pay for it. You can't say to schools in the inner city, you've got to do better than you've done with these kids who come from a Latino background and don't speak English, and then at the same time say, but it's okay to go to Channel One and get a grant that has kids watching advertising in history class, which is what Channel One does. We can't do it at the same time. It's just it's hypocrisy. 
You can't demand, as we have a right to, that they do better by their kids in the inner city and then at the same time let them, out of desperation, sell out to a commercial corporation where part of the time in the classroom is spent looking at commercials, something we would never tolerate. No middle class American would say if your teacher or principal said, by the way, I have a great solution to the problem. We'll reduce your tuition by 10% if the kids can watch commercials during history class. We'd say, are you crazy? I'm not having my kids watch commercials during class. That's not what I'm paying for. But as citizens, we look the other way. We wink at each other. We say, well, if they're willing to do that, and that's not so bad. The kids are watching commercials all the time anyway, so who cares? And besides, it's not exactly our kids who are doing it because something like 90% of the kids who are in Channel One schools or in inner city schools where the middle class doesn't have their kids anymore because they're in suburban public schools or they're in private schools. So we allow two Americas to be created, and that further tears apart the fabric of our country and makes it harder for us to find common ground. So yes, public education's in trouble. Yes, we've forgotten a good deal about the civic mission of the schools. Yes, teachers aren't doing their job very well, and the professoriate to which I belong has largely forgotten what the liberal arts really mean. But until we as a citizenry can again recognize the role that public education and public institutions ought to be playing in our society, we will pay the price of a polarized, divided, alienated democracy in which 50% of the people don't vote and 85% of young people don't vote, and in which young people are angry and cynical at politicians, and in which on the two sides of the political aisle we call each other not wrong, and maybe you better listen to me because I got a better idea, but we call each other traitors and un-American and fascists and communists and all these stupid terms that add nothing to civic discourse that make it impossible for us even to talk to one another about the things that divide us. It starts and finishes in a democracy with education and with the schools. So let me conclude by saying that if we really care about our democracy and the challenges and threats and perils that it's facing, the uncertainty that it faces, then we have to come back and begin to think again about civic education, about the civic missions of our schools, and about the central place of public education in our lives. And we have every right to criticize, to ask vital questions, challenging questions, to make demands of the administrators and faculty members of those schools. But before we do any of that, we have to say, Public education is important and we will pay the freight to make it work. That's our first responsibility. If we do that and could put schools back into the center of the discourse about democracy's challenges, then I think we can guarantee a much better future for democracy and perhaps more importantly, guarantee a future for our children. Thank you. We'll now open the program for questions from the, floors, um, from the floor. Questions are a privilege for City Club members only. Our first question will be asked by our board host, Chris Smith. Chris um, is a member of the Board of Governors and is the lead internet technologist for the Xerox Office Group. Chris uh, was chaired our advocacy, advocacy and Awareness Board for the last three years. Chris? So I'm going to ask from the perspective of a parent. I'm the stepfather of a very pixelated 17-year-old who, even though he has passed his AP U.S. history test and will get college credit for the work he did in high school, um, has no interest in current events, won't participate when his mother and I try and discuss events of the day at the dinner table, uh, and tells me that this country is already no longer a democracy. Um, I really don't know how to reach him, even though I try and obviously model uh, very participative democratic activity. Um, I guess the one ray of hope that I have 
uh, comes from some of that media. During the last uh, presidential campaign, uh, he regularly watched The Daily Show, and he came home with Jon Stewart's book, America, which he paid for with his own money from his own allowance, um, and seems to me in the vast sea of media we have at least one place where uh, the spin gets satirized on both sides and maybe has some grains of truth. Um, so is there a way I can encourage his media consumption in, in a useful way, and what else can I do as a parent? Thanks, Chris. Uh, a vital question. A great number of young people, not just 14 and 15, but even 25, get their primary news not from newspapers. 60 to 70 percent of Americans no longer read any newspaper, not even U.S. Today. And most Americans who get their news from television watch only local television. They don't even watch the national broadcasts or CNN or the uh, other things. So it's exactly that problem. But a lot of young people do watch daily, the Daily Show, they go to blogs, they go on the internet, they do have their own ways of accessing in. And some people want to discourage that, I don't, I say anyway, there are lots of different ways in. And if your way in is that way, that's just fine. But the second thing, I think there's, I think what's happened a little bit, when we have discussions like this about citizenship and civic education and responsibility, I think young people get a sense that here are a bunch of kind of starry-eyed, old, garrulous idealists talking about kind of, gee, you should be altruistic, you should get out there and do your duty and help other people and so on. And that's just, that's a message that in these skeptical, cynical times doesn't sell. But that's why I said a little earlier, democracy is actually only secondarily about responsibility and obligations and rights. It's first of all about power. And the first thing I'd say to young people, and I do say to young people, is you may not be interested in politics or power, but politics and power are interested in you. And you will notice that more and more. And if you don't pay attention, fine, but others will pay attention. And if you're not worried about how taxes are going to be paid and at what levels and what kind of institutions you're going to live in, someone else will make them for you. So getting young people to see the connection between what happens in their daily life and politics is part of the issue. That's one reason, by the way, why I believe deeply in universal service. I believe every young American should serve in either the military or the Peace Corps or some other form of national community service to get a sense of what it means, to get a sense of what it means to actually be part of that structure. Believe me, if your kid thinks he's about to be drafted to go to Iraq, he will take a lively interest in the war in Iraq and try to establish whether he thinks it's a good thing or a bad thing. And by the way, so will his parents. But it's very easy when we're sending the so-called volunteers, who are mostly people from poorer, less educated quarters in America, off to make the sacrifice. And we sit at home and watch. It's, you know, why get involved? It doesn't affect us directly. So we have to be able, young people have to see the connections, and we have to help them make those connections. There's this decoupling. Uh, a, year, a couple of years ago, we did a survey of young people, and we asked them, what are the most important American institutions? And 70% of them said, jury trial by your peers. And I thought, that's good. They really understand that in a democracy, having trial by jury of your peers is a great thing. But we then said, and how many believe in mandatory jury service? And 90% said no. Now, where they thought the juries were going to come from that would give them trial by your peers, I don't know. That's that disconnection. You know, so we have to re... But we've, we've made the disconnections, and they live it. So for the most part, when I see kids you know, living the wrong message and saying the wrong things, I, I don't say, how come you think that? I think, I wonder how he learned that. From whom did he learn that? Where did she see that? And generally, it was from us. It was the messages they were getting between the official messages on their TV screens, from the news, from the politicians. So a lot of that has to do with the messages that we are sending. We need to get back to the relationship between power and liberty, between responsibility and rights. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for your comments. They were very inspirational. I'm Chris Allman, and I'm a parent and an activist in education. and. Uh, what I keyed in on was your sense of uh, the resp response of desperation. And what I see with public schools in lowering um, benchmark testing in terms of what they do 
to help make the state make the grade is concerning to me in desperation. I get concerned about other responses that happen, for example, in my own kids' school district, where um, Title I funding for deserving schools, middle and high schools, is not going to them because of concerns that they won't make adequate yearly progress and what will happen as repercussions. So my question for you has to do with how do we deal with these acts of desperation that don't help further the cause of how we support education? Well, this comes back to the fact that the real educators of our kids and ourselves are the media, and how the media tells our stories has a lot to do with how people and how the public react. A lot of the so-called taxpayer revolt has to do with the way in which media cover the way th monies are spent and how they cover these things. So part of the question is maybe media literacy, getting back in control of our democratic media. You know, back in 1934, when in the Roosevelt years, they passed the first, uh, uh, the first great uh, uh, national uh, act covering communications. The airways were seen as a public utility. In 1996, under a democratic administration, the public airwaves were in effect declared private because of the broadcast spectra, the multiplicity of new broadcast spectra, all the digitalization and so on. People said, it's not a public utility anymore. Everybody can get their own. Everybody can have a blog, a website, so we don't need it anymore. We, in effect, privatized our public media, and we've lost the ability to control and use our media. So part of it is getting back to the message on the media, but part of it is how, of course, we ourselves as parents and teachers uh, the message we put out. Sometimes in our desperation, we put out a message that is angry and resentful and turns people off. The third thing is we have to once again create a sense of a common wheel in which people who are not parents don't say, no, I'm not for that school bond. I don't have kids in school anymore. You know, if we think about our politics in terms of our private interests, the minute your kids are out of school, you don't care anymore. If you think about it in terms of citizenship, we have a lifelong obligation to public institution, whether or not our kids are in school. But the private and personalized way of thinking we have means that, and you see the social scientists show it, when you look at school bonds, there's an almost perfect correspondence between support for school bonds and what percentage of the population in that district has kids in school which means people who don't have kids in school think it's somehow, oh, that's the selfish special interest of parents, as if children aren't the future of America for all of us, whether there are children or not. But we've lost that way of thinking. So in a way, it's a circular thing. In the absence of civic education, we no longer think in we and public in common terms, and that makes us much harder for us to think about public education itself in those terms. So we've got to find ways to break out of that cycle. I'm Ray Polani, a city club member. Uh, Mr. Barber, I subscribe to what you said 100%. I am an American by choice. I was born and raised and educated in Italy. I came here at the age of 30. I had what is known in Italy as a liberal ed arts education. I had eight years of Latin and five years of ancient Greek. I know how important ancient Greece and Rome were to our republic, res publica you mentioned. Well, it seems to me that yes, public education is absolutely central and essential. And it seems to me that the mandate is to teach people that rights are inseparable from responsibilities. And community service is essential Community involvement is essential. And I think this must lead to a respect for nature, for the natural world in which we operate and live and without which we cannot exist. Much more so now in this global world that we are involved. So my question is, have I interpreted right what is, should be done. Have I made the right choice? Well, actually, I know I have made the right choice to become an American. But you, what do you think? You said it, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's, a, that's a very nice, prescient summary of, I think, 
the things we're exactly talking about today, and I appreciate, I think we all ought to remember, it's often those who voted with their feet to come here and become part of a democratic society who best understand both the virtues, but also the demands such a society make on us. Those who are born into it somehow think it's a birthright, we don't have to worry about it, we don't have to fight for it. We want to remember, in most parts of the world, people are still fighting and giving up their lives to get the right that half of us don't exercise and many of the rest of us don't really care about very much. Mind you, I was born and raised under fascism. Thank you. Carol Witherell, City Club member. Um, I'm thinking about our civic life around the world as well as our civic life at home. And so my question is, is the kind of democratic civil society that you've described <clears throat> sustainable or retrievable in a world whose economy is dominated by mega corporate interests and empire building with little place little regard for local economies and civic interests. What responsibilities do government, does our government and do our corporations have in apprenticing liberty and civic life both at home and around the world? Let's see, my plane leaves about 4.30. I think I can answer that question between now and then. Uh, that's obviously a very important question. One of the things we have to think about when we think about democracy and citizenship is in a setting of globalization. I mean, it's very different than it was 100, uh, 200, or even 10 or 15 years ago now. And thinking about what it means to be in a democracy, to teach citizenship to young people in a world of interdependence, where almost everything that happens happens as a result of forces beyond our borders. Whether we're worried, think of the things we're worried about, terrorism, the drug trade, international weapons, prostitution and crime across borders, SARS, AIDS, avian flu, global warming. Not one of those things is under the direct control of our government. Even if we were all deeply involved and this was a participatory democracy, our government in Washington couldn't by itself begin to solve any of those problems. Most of the players in the modern world, the most powerful ones, are NGOs, not just individual corporations and so on, but uh, Al-Qaeda is a malevolent NGO, if you think about it. You know, it's not a state actor. You can't get it by states. It's out there operating in the interstices of the system. So one of the largest questions we face is how do you meet the challenges of globalization, of global threats and global problems with 19th century nation state democracies that still fight over their borders and operate one by one. And it's not just the United States that acts unilaterally. The French, when it comes to their interests, are equally unilateralists. The Chinese are equally unilateralists. Most states do what we do. They cooperate when it suits their interests and for the rest of the time, they don't. And when someone they don't like, like us, refuses to cooperate, they call us unilateralists, but they're only multilateralists where it serves their interests. The fact is nation states mostly serve themselves, and yet we live in a world of problems, and you name some of them, but there are many others as well, that require common democratic action across borders. That means we need citizens without borders, it means we need civic institutions without borders, and civic education without borders. We haven't even got it inside our borders, so what you've done is shown us that we have an even larger set of challenges to meet, and uh, to do that is going to take even more more time, more energy, and more money. Justin Gottlieb, City Club member. Uh, my mind is swimming with questions, but the first is, I notice that with my, in my age demographic and society that everyone's really focused on the answers, whether that's taking the SATs or the Scantron tests or the multiple choice. How do we get people to start focusing in on the questions again, because the questions are far more important than the answers. And that's true of young people all the way through uh, retirees. Well, again, that's exactly the right question. And we are an end, we're a short term, 90 day, immediate profitability oriented society. We want to see what the outcomes are. We were talking a little earlier about how do you measure a civic education program? And you know, that's, you measure it over 30 or 40 years. Does a whole generation 
30 or 40 years later isn't more deeply involved and deeply engaged. But you can't measure that in a way that a Congress or a state legislative committee can say, ah, see, taxpayer, you're getting your money's worth. You know, we want our bang for the buck and we want it today, but most of the things we care about take a long time. Imagine trying to evaluate a friendship, let alone a marriage, in a three-week or three-month time frame you know, and prove this marriage is going to work in three months, you know, I mean, it, it takes long, hard work. So that, this short-term outlook, this short horizon outlook, this need to get immediate cost-benefit analyses is very hard on the things we most care about and the things we most need to do, and that's particularly true of education. I know that as an educator. I have some students who were, when they were in my classroom, I thought, what, you know, oh my God, what's he doing in college? Why is she even here? And 10 years later, she'll say, I'll meet that person, she'll say, by the way, you know, when I was in your classroom, I was asking myself, what am I doing here? Why am I even here? And I found part of the answer to that while I was working with you, but it took 10 years, really, to figure out what it was that was happening. So these things do take a long time. The questions are more important than the answers. The process is more important than the destination, but that's hard to sell. And we live in a society where you've got to sell things, where people want to pay for things and they want to know what the cost is and what the bottom line is and they want to do it on a quarterly uh, uh, timekeeping basis. So we're running up against the kind of prejudice of our times and I guess the only answer I have is we've got to fight the prejudice. We've got to say that the things we care about are the questions, not the answers, the process, not the outcome, the long term vitality of democracy, not whether we solve this or that particular issue tomorrow. And, you know, it's us that have to set those priorities. That that's what we care about, and that's what we're going to insist on. Bill Savage, City Club member, thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Barber. Um, question, is it possible for one country, such as the U.S., to export democracy to another, such as Iraq, and if so, how, how, would, how would it be successfully done? The short answer is read my book, Fear's Empire, published last year, which raises exactly that question. But in a word, no. Democracy cannot be exported. It cannot be installed in another country by force. And overthrowing tyranny, which you can do by force, and establishing democracy, which you cannot do by force, are two different things. And the mistake we made in Iraq was to think that in overthrowing a brutal dictator, and I give credit to the administration, it did that, although that's not why it did it, but nonetheless it did it, but to think that having done that, democracy would kind of spring up in place of the tyranny that was overthrown was to misunderstand everything we've talked about today, the slow building of democracy by building civic institutions, civic education, and citizenship, which takes a very long time. So no, you cannot export democracy. I do believe every human being, and I agree with President Bush on this, every culture and society is capable of democracy, but they each have their own path, their own ways, and it has to happen from the inside out, not from the outside in. Gilly Burlingham, City Club and, and Corporate Personhood member. And since you brought up democracy in school, I would like to ask you about democracy school. I never heard of this before, although I understand it's been going for 10 years or more. Our end corporate personhood group, which was breathed into life when Tom Hartman came to town last year, is planning to sponsor it in December if enough people come and are interested, because it's a bit pricey since they have to fly out from the East Coast. Are you familiar with Democracy School? And if so, what do you think about it? No, I'm not familiar with it, but I hope you will you know, let people in the room know and that you have a flyer about it and anyone who is interested in it maybe can come to you and then they can Google it presumably and look the, it up uh, and figure it out. The co-convener of Ancorp Person is right over there and we'll be glad to tell everybody about it. From what I, I Googled it today and I gather what they're trying to do is exactly what you're talking about, empowering citizens to become active and not to mm -hmm. feel powerless. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've just been reading a book by Yvonne Chouinard who created Patagonia and it talks about the philosophies he has of his company um, which is for one thing to be in existence for a hundred years, a hundred years from now, uh, be decent to its employees and so forth and protective of the environment. Um, for example, they will not buy um, industrial cotton anymore. Um, so my question to you is, 
if you're speaking to industry and business, um, what, what do you say to them about, let's say, responsible, corporate responsibility? I have a dual message, and I'm a little ambivalent about corporate responsibility. Maybe that will seem odd to you, but let me tell you why. Because, of course, we want responsible corporate citizens. Of course, we want corporations that work hard not to do what an earlier speaker said, which was to uh, spread practices and products around the world that are harmful. We don't want American tobacco companies figuring out they can get around American laws about tobacco to children by going to third world countries and selling their tobacco to children there where they don't yet have laws. Obviously, that's important. But let me say we cannot ask private corporations responsible to their shareholders and whose job it is to sell products and make profits, we can't ask them to do the job that we're supposed to do as citizens. We can't refuse to con constitute ourselves as a citizenry and as a commonweal and say, well, we're not doing it, but why don't you corporations, instead of doing what you're actually supposed to be doing, which is meeting the needs of your shareholders and buying and selling the stuff that you sell, you have to sort of take over the responsibilities of citizenship on our behalf. We've failed, now you do it. The proper place to regulate, to oversee, to contain the depredations of wild capitalism, to make capitalism work, to keep capitalism honest, to make its entrepreneurial side work well, to guarantee uh, safeguards and safety nets for workers, is not corporations themselves, it's the public wheel, it's democracy. There's a wonderful synergy between private corporations and a public democracy when they work well together. The problem today is not that corporations have become irresponsible, but that we as citizens have become irresponsible. We are the ones not doing our job. If we do our job and create the right kind of container for capitalism, capitalism can do just fine. You know, pushing hard and being productive and being prosperous, but not worrying too much about some of the things that we worry about when we put on our public caps. Most of the corporate managers I know are pretty good citizens, but they're a little schizophrenic because as citizens they wear one hat and as corporate managers they wear another. But it's really not up to them to take off their corporate hat and wear only their civic hat. We all have to do that. If we create a vibrant, robust, transparent democracy that's doing its job of oversight, regulation, justice, fairness, antitrust, then we can let capitalism do what it does best, which is to make products, to make profits for shareholders, to make money, and to make prosperity. Let's let social justice, safety nets, insurance and fairness in our society be the fundamental concern of us as citizens and let's let corporations do what they do well. That's the fair division of labor in a democratic society. Thank you. There's at least about 20 topics in that speech uh, for City Club to discuss further. Dr. Benjamin Barber, thank you, and we're adjourned.